This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. Being happy is great. Moments of joy are great, but being whole and complete is the real life goal. Visit betterhelp.com slash super and get on your journey to finding wholeness. Hey, brother. Snape, Snape, Severus Snape. You're welcome. We all know him, the potions master, the half-blood prince, the least showered person at Hogwarts, probably, and also a vampire. Obviously. Now, while they're fairly uncommon within the series, we do know for a fact that vampires exist within the wizarding world. There is, of course, Sanguini, who actually shows up on page in Slughorn's party during Half-Blood Prince. Blood-flavored lollipops, which are available at Honeydukes and Hermione expects are actually meant for vampires. And Gilderoy Lockhart couldn't have gotten very far with what is supposed to be very real events during Voyages with Vampires if the people within the wizarding world weren't aware of the fact that vampires are real. And honestly, the list really does go on. But the question for today is whether or not the pale hook-nosed figure that resides in the potions dungeons and also roams the castle all throughout the night is in fact a vampire. And I will be completely honest with you guys, I have seen this idea thrown around before. And at first I was really unsure how I felt about it. But after I started digging in, I was blown away at how much I found. So today we examine the mountain of evidence that supports the idea that Snape is a vampire. Hey brother! Okay, Snape, vampires. First things first, let's lay a little bit of groundwork as to how this idea could function. Throughout the series, it is not uncommon for characters to have like traits or hints as to other characteristics of their character. For example, we know that Sirius Black has the ability to turn into a dog and his name is a direct reference to the Sirius Star, which is also known as the Dog Star. His laugh is frequently characterized as a bark and his primary driver for most of the series is loyalty. I wanna die! I wanna die rather than betray my friends! At one point during a flashback, James points out Snape to Sirius, and the way he reacts is literally just compared to a dog. Sirius' head turned, he become very still, like a dog that had scented a rabbit. And one of his best friends, Remus Lupin, is very much the same. Once again, his name is a direct reference to the mythology of Romulus and Remus, who founded Rome and were raised by wolves. Then Lupin comes from the Latin word lupus, which just literally means wolf. Beyond that, Lupin's better qualities still mimic those of wolves. Like for one, he's incredibly intelligent. And on top of that, like in contrast to Sirius's more combative or competitive attitude towards things, Remus is a lot more known for being like calm-minded or open to negotiation. This is pretty symbolic for like how dogs tend to fight for dominance versus the more like democratic nature, if you will, of wolves that actually peacefully form a pack unless they're threatened. Moving on from the Marauders, we also have Rita Skeeter, who is also an Animagus and can turn into a beetle, which is pretty perfect when paired with her career of like, gotcha journalism. What? Gotcha! And the idea that bugging a line is the same as like, listening in on other people's conversations. In what way? That way. You put gotcha on my face. But I bring all this up because if there is one creature that Snape is constantly compared to throughout the books, it is the one that is most associated with vampires, a bat. This first comparison comes from, of all people, Professor Quirrell when Harry discovers him in the chamber under the school trying to recover the Philosopher's Stone. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful having him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect p -p poor stuttering Professor Quirrell? And this one's kind of interesting because of another detail that we know about Quirrell in particular. When Harry and Hagrid first run into him in the Leaky Cauldron in Philosopher's Stone, he excuses himself from the conversation to, I've g -g got to go pick up a new book on vampires m myself. And you might just think like that this could be like an excuse to leave the conversation that Quirrell may have wanted to leave for other much more obvious reasons, but I don't actually think so when you consider what Harry discovers on his first day of class with Professor Quirrell. His classroom smelled strongly of garlic, which everyone said was to ward off a vampire he'd met in Romania and was afraid would be coming back to get him one of these days. Okay, so clearly it seems like he is trying to ward off vampires, but also one, Quirrell is not actually afraid of everything and everyone. He's just putting on an act and two, who is actively keeping an eye on Quirrell for all of year one? Dumbledore turned to Paige and said without looking up, 
keep an eye on Quirrell, won't you? Yeah, Dumbledore's of course talking to Snape in that situation, but do you see what I mean? Like, Quirrell is not actually paranoid. His real concern here is that Snape is on to him, not that he's like just generically afraid of vampires showing up. And also in just a real bit of irony, later on in the same story, it's Quirrell who we see sucking blood from a dead unicorn. But either way, that's not really the point. The point is like, if he's not actually afraid of vampires, then what's up with the garlic smell? And I think the answer is that he's trying to repel a specific vampire. Snape. And what's even more interesting about Quirrell in particular being the first person to compare Snape to a bat is that he does so standing in front of the mirror of Erised, which also offers another curious layer to this idea because do you know who can't see their own reflection? Vampires. It would make Dumbledore's decision to use the mirror of Erised in particular even more clever than it already is. Because if this is true and you can't see your own reflection, then it would all but prevent you from ever being able to successfully use the mirror. Now, we do of course all know that Dumbledore trusts Snape, but we also know that he never lets him actually teach defense against the dark arts, which means he might have the tiniest little worry that there could still be a concern there. And I guess I shouldn't say that he never let Snape teach anything defense against the dark arts related because just in the next year, Chamber of Secrets, he does teach Harry Expelliarmus. It's during Lockhart's dueling club where Snape steps in with a recommendation of his own. A bad idea, Professor Lockhart, said Snape, gliding over like a large malevolent bat. This is obviously a very brief lesson that he teaches Harry as they only ever seem to do the dueling club once. Tut, tut. But then there is also Harry's third year where Snape does step in for Lupin while he's out. In this particular instance, he's not specifically referred to as bat-like, although we do know that he likes the room nice and dark for class. He is obviously super petty during this particular time though, basically outing Lupin's werewolf status to Hermione by jumping ahead to, which page was it again? 394. Oh yeah, how could I forget? The point is, he is placing every available clue before Lupin's own class as to his true condition. Honestly, it's a super jerk move, but it does make this next scene 10 times better when you have this particular idea in the back of your mind. It happens when Lupin steps in on Snape's discovery of the Marauder's map. Well, said Lupin, clapping his hands together and looking around cheerfully, Matt seems to clear that up. Severus, I'll take this back, shall I? He folded up the map and tucked it inside of his robes. Harry, Ron, come with me. I need a word about my vampire essay. Excuse us, Severus. Snape assigns them an essay about werewolves and Lupin responds in the most marauder way possible. The exact same thing. He assigns an essay on vampires. Also, also, the fact that this feud exists in the first place is even more telling because vampires and werewolves are just classically adversaries of one another. Also, 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 Dean and Seamus close out their school year with the following exchange. Wonder what they'll give us next year, said Seamus Finnegan gloomily. Maybe a vampire, suggested Dean, hopefully. I mean, you're close, boys. Give it a couple years, though. Prepare yourself. Guys, we need to take a quick pause to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. You guys might be well aware by now that Bespoke Post is one of my absolute favorite brands to work with here at Super Carlin Brothers. One, because I have been a long time subscriber to the product long before they ever sponsored the show. And two, because they partner with small businesses to put together all of their amazing boxes of awesome. Here lately, I have just been absolutely loving all of the little doodads from the point box, especially this gold pen, which I've been using just every single day since I unboxed it. You know how when something just like has the right weight? This has the right weight. I've also found the blanket from the cocoon box incredibly versatile. I used this at the hospital when my daughter was born and on a backpacking trip just a couple of months ago. But the next box that I'm super stoked for as cozy season is upon us is the flame box, which comes with, wait for it, an indoor fireplace. Like what? Just that combination of words gets me excited. If you know anything about me, you know that I absolutely love a good old fashioned outdoor fire pit. And this brings the fire pit right inside. But if that's not your jam, then absolutely no worries, Bespoke Post really has something for everyone. And that's thanks to releasing a ton of new boxes every single month across a huge variety of categories. My pro tip here is that for the holidays, if you want to gift somebody this particular subscription, order them one box that you can actually give them as the gift and then let them choose the next couple of months. 
sense. And if you're not sure what's right for you, they do have a handy quiz over at boxofawesome.com to help you decide. It is free to sign up and you can skip or cancel at any time, but plus get 20% off your first box when you head on over to boxofawesome.com and use promo code SUPER at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER at checkout to get 20% off your first box. One last time, boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER, link is in the description down below. Either way though, that will bring us to a Goblet of Fire where once again, there's a fair bit of a hint. Remember how Hermione ultimately discovers how Rita Skeeter is going about getting all of the private information from private conversations? First, we have this exchange. No, said Hermione suddenly, I want to know how she heard me talking to Victor and how she found out about Hagrid's mom. Maybe she had you bugged, said Harry. And it's not until way later in the book on the train ride home that we finally discover that this is actually what tipped Hermione off. How did you find out, said Ron, staring at her. Well, it was you really who gave me the idea, Harry, she said. Did I, said Harry perplexed. How? Bugging, said Hermione happily. Let me just tell you, this might not be the only time that Harry absolutely nails it in his fourth year. Earlier in the story, they're trying to figure out how it was possible that Snape could have gotten to the forest before Harry. Hang on, how fast do you reckon he could have gotten down to the forest? Do you reckon he could have beaten you and Dumbledore there? Not unless he can turn himself into a bat or something, said Harry. Wouldn't put it past him, Ron muttered. Do you see what I mean? It's like the same literary tricks. We just never actually get the true payoff, which I do think might actually ultimately come if we fast forward for just a minute to the Battle of Hogwarts in Deathly Hallows. McGonagall and Snape are having their epic duel and it ends when Snape launches himself out of a window, except he doesn't fall to his death. With a tingle of horror, Harry saw in the distance a huge bat-like shape flying through the darkness toward the perimeter wall. Exactly two people can fly unsupported like this, and it's Snape and Voldemort. And it's always been assumed that Snape learned this particular skill from his master. But who's to say it's even the same version of unsupported flight? I mean, we have descriptions of Voldemort flying and it's not considered bat-like at all. But let's pause there for just one second and head back to Half-Blood Prince because Snape is officially Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher and he's making the room nice and cozy for himself. Harry looked around as they entered. Snape had imposed his personality upon the room already. It was gloomier than usual as the curtains had been drawn over the windows and was lit by candlelight. To be fair to Snape, he is actually pretty good at instruction where he immediately gets the class started on nonverbal magic, where he swept between them as they practiced, looking just as much like an overgrown bat as ever, lingering to watch Harry and Ron struggling with the task. Aw, oh, bats, he's at it again. The thing is though, this should come as no surprise. Snape has always been this way over and over and over again, he's compared to the infamous creature of the night. And you might just think he's had a pretty tragic life. He's dark and shadowy. It just sort of fits with his character. And that's all well and fine, but Snape really has always been like this. Again, back in Deathly Hallows, after Snape dies, spoilers, he gives Harry a memory, a memory that will help Harry understand everything. And when we go inside of that memory, what do we find? Snape as a young boy. No, said Snape. He was highly colored now and Harry wondered why he did not take off the ridiculously large coat, unless it was because he did not want to reveal the smock beneath it. He flapped after the girls, looking ludicrously bat-like, like his older self. Here's the thing. Snape is constantly being described as pale with sallow skin, thin with greasy black hair lying like curtains in front of his face. He is always dressed in all black. He can constantly be found roaming the castle in the middle of the night. Time after time, he is compared to a bat and he is capable of unsupported flight. And similarly to real bats, which are considered to be as smart as dolphins or horses, Snape is incredibly intelligent. Something I didn't actually know about bats prior to researching this video and somehow not even the most interesting thing that I uncovered. This last bit was like the icing on the cake for me, as most creatures within the animal kingdom are highly distinguishable from one another in embryo form. There is one really odd exception. According to National Geographic, it is incredibly difficult at this stage to tell the difference between bats and wait for it, snakes. Or should I say snapes? Am I right? Bats and snakes are not even remotely close to one another. Bats are mammals and snakes are reptiles. But this is the ultimate analogy, right? Because Snape is the ultimate triple agent. He is undercover with Voldemort's Slytherin-minded regime. You might look and act like a snake, but ultimately, 
he's a bat. Now I want to end this video with the caveats. I started this video with two particular pieces of information in the back of my mind. One is that in an article on Pottermore, JK Rowling actually acknowledges the fact that she had originally intended to have a vampire be a member of the Hogwarts staff, a character named Trokar, but later discarded this idea. Two is that in that same article, she also says that while Snape bears resemblance to a vampire, he is not one. But honestly, as I found more and more information that was supporting this particular idea, I was finding it harder and harder to believe that on some level, Snape wasn't intended to be one. Book after book, there are just so many allusions to this idea. He fits so many of the classic vampire tropes so well. So despite this particular piece of insight from the author of the story itself, I personally still find myself fairly convinced. But for my question of the day, I want to know, what do you think? Did I convince you that Snape could possibly be a vampire, let me know in the towel section down below. But guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like some more Harry Potter speculation from us, you can check out this video right over here where we talk about whether or not Filch could be a poltergeist. I've always felt so strongly about that particular theory. Go and check it out. Otherwise, until next time, bye.